everybody. I am currently at San Diego Comic-Con, so for that very reason, uh, we weren't sure how easy it was going to be for me to release an episode. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but San Diego actually charges you for access to their Wi-Fi during the San Diego Comic-Con convention, and the, hotels, and the hotels charge a shit ton of money, so you might be getting this a lot earlier than normal. Uh, that's because we didn't want you to go a week without an episode, but hopefully you guys enjoy this. This is our... A uh, little retroactive episode to when we talked about a movie that all three of us fell in love with uh, the first time we saw it, uh, Phantom of the Paradise. It's the only movie that was in the Terror Takedown or the Twitter Takedown that wasn't uh, from the 80s or 90s, uh, and that was because we just love it so fucking much. We had to, we had to throw it in there. Uh, well, we talked about this in the past where we would all love to do movies from other genre, or from other decades, but. Really, before the '80s, most movies were very, very serious. This one is not like that. It's it's a really good time to watch, and it's got a sweet soundtrack, and it's it's also quite depressing. So, I mean, it's it's one of a kind as far as '70s movies yeah, go. And this isn't going to be. Uh, I mean, we'll give you a heads up. It, this is not going to be uh, one of the more laugh out loud retroactive episodes because we all just love the like we just love the movie so much and and there is some funny parts where we are just like just so over enthusiastic about how much we love it but it's definitely more that we feel like this movie is so painfully uh un untalked like just not talked about so we wanted to to throw this together to hopefully uh let a few people know that it even exists uh because i yeah. think it's still a very hidden gem even though it's gotten a beautiful double disc blu-ray from from Scream Factory, and I, I know that I'm sounding like I am fucking Mr. Scream Factory, and I might have an interview with someone from Scream Factory <laughs> at San Diego Comic Con that'll be on a future episode of the Save More Show. But honestly, it is it, the fact that they did the reason. There's a reason why they did a double disc for this bad boy. It is literally a masterpiece, and I, and I'm not saying that in a you know I refer to like dolls and and alligator is a masterpiece but this movie is actually super well shot it's well paced it's got good story moments it's funny it's charming like it's all of the things that when you think of like good cinema it is those things i mean since matt showed it to us uh scott has bought the vinyl for it yeah uh, i went as thing. i went as beef for halloween i own two fucking t-shirts from Phantom of the Paradise, like we've we've quickly become obsessed with this movie, and like yeah, I it's... also uh, during the Twitter takeover, um, I released a metal cover of Life at Last. So yeah, we're all pretty obsessed with this. Yeah, film. this movie. I, I think that there was a solid month where Adam and I exclusively listened to the soundtrack and would just send each other lyrics from the soundtrack that we were particularly fond of. Yeah, I, I, I know. That. I know every word from that soundtrack front to back. Even <laughs> even like Phoenix's songs and stuff. I still know. <laughs> I yeah. want to hear you sing Phoenix's versions. <laughs> only only Adam can do the cantata. I, I anyone find... else that tries dies. dies. <laughs> I find like I will sometimes find myself I think we all admit that we sing in the shower once in a while and I uh I find myself singing the song Faust all the fucking time because it's such a good song. <laughs> Uh, the especially the 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 big the big ending, the big powerful ending that sounds like it could be in a meatloaf song. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my tears are lost and I can't sleep. It was uh, way too was... sober to sing that right now, buddy. <laughs> yeah. If it was uh, the hell of it for me. I really attached onto that one for for a good long time. There's a, a and side note after you listen to this episode, if you want something really kind of wacky, uh, go ahead and. <laughs> Search on YouTube, Paul Williams, The Hell of It, and you'll find a really weird performance of that song on a TV show back when he was, like, at the pinnacle of his drug abuse with, like, girls in bikinis dressed as devils swimming around in a swimming pool while he's just, like, standing there gyrating on a stage singing the song. It's and This this is, like, a family fun time variety hour, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, Sonny and Cher's, like, talent show or whatever. It's It's fantastic. So... Uh, hopefully, if some of you guys are at San Diego Comic Con and you're hearing this, I will be at the Geekscape booth most of the time uh, until about Saturday afternoon at three nine one nine. That is our booth number. Swing by and and say hi if you're out there. 
uh, you know, obviously, I love to talk to you guys about the podcast. I love to talk to you guys about horror movies. And if you're one of, like, the 50% of our audience that are wrestling fans, I'll absolutely <laughs> talk to you about wrestling. Because I don't get to talk about it with these two guys that much. Oh, so, so sad. Sorry. Uh, so, definitely check it out. Enjoy this little retroactive episode. And we'll be back at our normal day of releasing episodes next week. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Reddit Horror Club. As always, I am joined by Adam and Scott, and today we are discussing The Phantom of the Paradise, as picked by myself, which means that hosting duties are going to be handed off to Scott. Scott, let's... Uh, 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 okay. I'll take it. I All love right, this. Adam, I want right. to talk about this. Adam, I'll go. Take... Go ahead, then. Adam. All right, Matt, I don't need to know why you picked this movie, but tell me why you picked this movie. Okay, so... I had never fucking heard of this movie, and this was pretty early on when I started listening to that Killer POV podcast. They would talk about this movie constantly. Uh, are, so, are they paying you to talk about Killer POV? Because no, I don't no, no, go no. a week without you talking about Killer POV. No, we've made it, we've made this joke many a yeah, time. This, it's, well, I mean, it's, it's I honestly think it's the best horror podcast out there. Uh, be behind ours. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they were talking about this, and this is like when I first started getting into the Scream Factory Blu-rays, because I had no clue that Scream Factory was even doing this shit. And uh, the one guy from Scream Factory had been on the on the podcast and was like, yeah, you know, we're doing a bunch of sales this July. Like, they were doing, like, every day a different DVD was on sale. And I happened to see that Phantom of the Paradise was the movie for, for that particular day. And I was like, oh, I heard good things. I'll buy it. So, I, like, I just bought it on a whim. I had some money to spend or whatever. And... um I watched it and it fucking changed my life. And I watched it like I like literally bought this over the summer. So it has not been a full year since I've seen this movie and I've watched it seven fucking times in probably 5 or 6 months. I don't um, blame you. I don't blame you at all. I want to go back and watch it like tomorrow. <laughs> I watched it today. I want to watch it tomorrow. It's it's one of those movies where and I, I talked to you about this a little bit on Facebook. The second that you start to get like maybe slightly tired of the movie they introduce fucking beef and it just like takes that movie to the next fucking plateau it's so good um the songs are great the i I love the satire that it has on the music industry uh one of my favorite lines in it kind of making fun of the music industry is uh when paul williams opens up a a briefcase filled with prescription pills and says look it's breakfast yeah <laughs> like, like i i just i think it's one of those movies where it's like you could feasibly remake this movie because all of the points that it's trying to make in this movie are still relevant to no, the no 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 i don't right. ever want anyone to remake this movie i um, want them to re-release this movie in theaters so i can go watch it with a crowd but i don't ever want them to remake it I could get behind that. And actually, there is a theater. Uh, apparently, there's a theater not far from me, maybe about a half hour drive. It's the movie theater from the original Blob. Uh, and it still is in the exact state that it was in like 1958 when they made the Blob. And they do midnight screenings of stuff like this. Because when I first posted that I'd watched it, a bunch of people were like, oh shit, I saw that at the uh, old theater last year. So I'm kind of mad that I didn't know about it in time. To see it on the big screen, because I think this would be a blast to see live. Oh, it's so would. And apparently it was a huge flop when it came out, and the only theater that it ran at for any extended period of time was in Winnipeg, Manitoba, up here in Canada. <laughs> and I guess it like picked up a big cult following up here, and it played in that theater for like six months. Did you notice, I'm not sure if you paid attention to the closing credits, did you notice who the costume designer was on this movie? No. Sissy Spacek. Oh, for what? real? This is how she met Brian Dupama, and then he was like, I'm going to put you in my next movie, and he made Carrie. I'm almost certain nobody calls him Brian Dupama. 
Well, whatever. <laughs> Del Pomo. D E. It's D E. It's it's a pretty hard duh. <laughs> whatever. So Scott, hey. did you like this movie being a musician? Uh, I love this film. <laughs> Had you seen I've... this before? No. Sweet. Yeah, right. I'm super, super happy that you picked this, Scott. <laughs> I love... I'm so excited. I love the music. I thought it was great. The it's first a... song that Beef sings in the show is my favorite song in the movie. Oh, yeah. One where they're building him as like a giant Frankenstein, and then he plays like a guitar solo and gets electrocuted. It's fucking fantastic. <laughs> That's the only song Beef actually sings. Well, I mean, there's the song he's singing in the audition where he's trying to prove that he can... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the... Falls. the. Well, I, I just thought it was cool because there were so many, like, callbacks because I really like the Juicy Fruits because obviously... Yeah, 50s rock and roll. <laughs> um, I thought, Although I thought that the Jersey accent was a little much. During the speaking um, parts of their song. <laughs> yeah, and then um, uh, the surf song was... Genius upholstery, upholstery. I think yeah. is what it's called. Yeah. Um, oh, so fucking great. And uh, I mean, the music was just phenomenal. But um, then it was just so cool because they came back out a third time as dressed up as um, uh, the 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 monster from the cabinet of Doctor Caligari. Yeah. Um, and they're like chopping people's body parts out of the audience and stuff. People are losing their shit and. Then, you know, they, they build beef with that. Oh, my God. The only thing I don't like about Beef's song is when he uses the guitar like a dick and, like, humps the air a couple times because it's just so douchey. <laughs> well, yeah, but he's also tonguing it and playing it behind his head and doing all that douchebag stuff. The, like, okay, going into this movie, the first time that you heard Beef actually speak in his, like, super effeminate voice, did you lose your shit as much as I did? Yeah, there was one line. There was one line in particular. Here, I've, I've got it in my notes. Where is it? Like it's oh like God. this song was picked for a broad, like or something like that. <laughs> oh, it's when he's uh, when he's trying to leave, and the other guy's trying to like give him drugs, and he goes, "No, that's gonna bring me down." <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's also oh, good. Uh, yeah. He's like, you know what I think the problem is? Speed. You're the one that just hands them out. I'm the one that fucking does them. I know what I'm doing here. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out about this movie, and maybe this is just me, but the thing that I like about this movie is that it's absolutely batshit crazy, but I feel bad for Winslow throughout the entire movie. Like, I actually genuinely oh, yeah. care about his character. Oh, yeah. I've got notes about that. It was really, really bumming me out. Yeah. Oh, when he... When he the one line, it the guy should get an Oscar just for the delivery of this line for how sad it makes me say when he finds out that his teeth are going to get pulled and he's like, but I want my teeth. And it's like so genuinely sad. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Like I was really, the first time I watched this movie, I was like, this is going to, this is fucking making me depressed. And then the music started again. I was okay. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was also so angry at Swan this whole movie. Man, I hate that piece of but shit. Paul Williams is so, um, so one of my favorite things is Simon Pegg, uh, or not Simon Pegg, Edgar Wright. Edgar Wright called this movie out as his all-time favorite movie and uh, did this weird thing where he would do like a commentary track to the trailer of this movie on some website. And he talks about how uh, he he considers Swan's first line of dialogue when you see him on the screen as his all-time favorite like introduction to a character where he just walks into the room where Winslow's surrounded by a bunch of chicks and goes... Get this faggot out of here! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, it's I, I love this movie so much. I, I I was gonna save this for the next round, but then when we knew that we were at least two, if not all of us, were gonna be together, I was like, let's go with this instead of uh, the the more serious pick that I was gonna go with. Oh, absolutely! This is awesome, and I, I had a hard time throughout this movie, sort of like understanding why Swan was doing what he was doing. I was, I was like, I mean, you're obviously making all the wrong choices here. Everything is like everything you're doing. It just doesn't make any sense. And then you get that explanation as to like why he's doing. Like he just doesn't fucking care. I mean, yeah. he's immortal and he doesn't give a shit about anybody or anything. He can't die. I mean, what does he give a fuck? So of course he's gonna go around just completely fucking backstabbing everyone. Because what can they do to him? Yeah. They can't do anything. Well, and uh, I mean the the ending of this movie 
is like everything you think of when you think of like psychedelic film from the 70s like that whole fucking wedding sequence where it's just like crazy funk music and like just cut after cut after cut and it's like I love the shot of when they finally reveal Winslow's face and it's like these three different angles of the shot of him screaming and it like even the edit this movie is so well edited like the I like the split screen sequence during the uh the 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 like surf rock song where like you're seeing just the trunk of the car in one side of the screen and everything that's going on in the other and then it pans to like you're seeing how Winslow and Swan are both reacting to what's happening. It, it's such a good use of a split screen. The whole time that that scene was happening, I was like, oh, I'm going to watch that car blow up. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to distract me so I can't see it. I'm going to watch that car blow up. And the second it blows up, I was looking at the other fucking side of the screen. They got, <laughs> they got me. <laughs> I want to hear Scott talk more on this. He, you're falling asleep over there, Scott. Tell no, us. I'm not falling asleep. I just I've been letting you guys have your have your uh, good times. So with we it. can so we can come crash down with all of his issues. Oh, he hates it. <laughs> no, I don't. I love this movie. I have nothing bad to say about it. So um, I don't really I don't know what you want me to say about it. I mean, I I I feel like the the end is just so depressing. Um, because he's just he he loves her and and he watches her fuck Swan and uh, she like sells her soul too, but I guess they get it back because Swan gets killed. Uh, and and then you know like it's just brutal. Like the very end of this movie is super brutal, and I don't know. I liked it. It was a really really good movie. It just left me real down yeah. at the end. I like that it's a good mix of all these different famous stories, kind of like blend it together into like its own unique. Because at first I thought it was just like a rock opera version of Phantom of the Opera when I was going into it. Mm -hmm. But then you've got like Faust in there and you've got like a bunch of other stuff kind of mixed in to, to make it its own kind of unique version of the Phantom of the Opera. Well, if you look at the trivia on IMDb, I think it lists out seven different things. Seven different like horror um, literature that yeah. it's borrowing from. Uh, there's some Dorian Gray in there as well. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, Swan. Uh, yeah, it's and I, I actually think that this is probably my favorite film by Brian De Palma. Because um, I, I mean, I like the original Carrie, but I, I don't like. I'm not, like, head over heels about it. Oh, no. And, no. like, Sisters is okay. Like, he's done a lot of okay movies, but this is, like, the one film that I love by him. Like, I I, I will watch this again in, like, a, in probably in, like, a week. Like, I'd, I've been averaging about once a month I've made people watch this. Oh, I have it on a USB stick now. I'm going to go around just giving it to people and, like, making them watch it. It's and so this is another, I, I, I mean, to, to I, <laughs> is Killer POV sponsoring this podcast? No. Is, <laughs> is uh, Scream Factory promo, uh, sponsoring one of my podcasts? You better believe it. The Scream Factory <laughs> double disc DV, uh, Blu-ray of this is absolutely worth the money. Um just because you know one disc is just the movie and then the whole second disc is just like interviews with the composer uh how the how the music was put together how the camera shots were done interviews with the cinematographer like they went all fucking out on this blu-ray to just pack it with as much stuff as they could which is like <clears throat> shocking to me because this movie is like like there's a phrase that they use for uh, freaks where they, they used to call it the cult film that didn't have a cult yet. And like, I feel the same way towards Phantom of the Paradise. Like there's a very small group of people who know the movie, but it's definitely not like a cult film on like the Rocky horror level where, where you would think it would earn a, a double disc DVD. Uh, this deserves it so much more than Rocky horror. Uh, I, I, this movie is so much better than Rocky. And horror this is Picture two show. years prior to Rocky horror. Like the, the, and there's a lot of, like there's a lot of similarities between those movies in just like the way costumes and characters like beef looks like someone that would be in Rocky Horror Picture Show. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I I'll tell you why this wins over Rocky Horror. I was watching this and there was one song in here that I didn't really and it's not that I didn't even enjoy it. I just felt that it went on for too long and that's when um Phoenix does her audition for um Winslow and and Swan 
like yeah. when they're up in the the high rise or whatever. When, when she does that audition, I felt that went on a little bit too long. That's a that's like a five minute long song. So there was one song in here that I didn't like that much. There's one song in Rocky Horror Picture Show that I really love. <laughs> which is which one? Rose to uh, the World. <laughs> That's the yeah. one I fucking love. No, it's touch a touch a touch. It's fucking time warp. What are you... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like I like the other songs from Rocky Horror Picture Show. I want to get the soundtrack for this movie. I want to get to know these songs. I want to know the lyrics. I want to be able to sing along with these. It's on YouTube. Songs. Well, know what's even know what's really impressive about this movie too, in the sense that like. You know, you, when you were talking about like a song that that was kind of like went on and and should have been shorter, I was about to jump down your throat uh, because I thought you were going to say the song that Winslow performs in the very beginning of the movie. But like, I think that that's another thing that's so powerful about this movie is you know, it fucking in the first five ten minutes you've got a guy just sitting at a piano passionately playing a song, but the song's so good that it doesn't slow the movie down. Like you're like, okay. I- this, that song seems to be prevalent in like the first 45 minutes of the movie. He yeah. sings it. It's like it's sing like three, four different times. And that song's so good. I'm totally <laughs> fucking okay with it. Yeah. Like that. Uh, my, my one. So this was one of the first movies I did a, a weird ass movie night at my house with. And um, there was one person that had heard of it. And uh, he was going to be late. Like he's like, oh, I'm not going to make it there right away. Like I'll probably be like 10 minutes late. So we're watching the movie, and everyone's just kind of, like, not sure what to think of what they've just seen in the first, like, five minutes of this movie. Because it starts off with, like, a 50s rock song, and then it's just, like, a really weird conversation about how apparently you can't sign someone to a contract for life. And uh, all of a sudden, Winslow's song starts playing. And then we just hear this guy walking down the stairs to my basement singing the song because he's watched this movie so many goddamn times that he has the whole (laughs) soundtrack memorized. (laughs) I want to be that guy. <laughs> Man, I love this movie. You would have loved so... that dude because I told him that it was the it was the same night that I watched your pick from last round. Uh, the the lover, the the cook, the, the thief. yeah, that thing. And I mentioned that I watched it. and He goes, "Oh, that's one of the greatest movies ever made." And like he went on this whole rant about, it. I was like, "You need to watch every movie that the director's ever made because he's a fucking genius." Oh, uh, see, that's that guy that talked about the the falls. Or yeah, whatever. yeah, the falls. Yeah, see, maybe I wouldn't like that guy. So, but we get along about <laughs> Phantom of Paradise. That's for sure. All right, all right. I got notes. If we want to, yeah, let's uh, let's go to the notes. All right, so these are uh, El Fanto de Paradiso, the notes. Um, when when the opening sa- like describes Swan and like what Swan's all about, I'm like, this sounds like some shit I'd be really into if I still smoke pot. <laughs> Uh, I'm watching the first 50s band. I'm like, I fucking know Scott's loving this. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, who am I? I've kidding? heard I'm the fuck- surf rock version or yeah. surf rock song better. Personally. I'm like, who am I kidding? I'm I'm fucking loving this shit. Right now. It's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a, that's some seriously clunky exposition where he's like trying to explain to him how he couldn't sign this chick, blah blah blah, and Swan's off screen. It's it's like a full three and a half minutes of him just looking into the camera and being like. This and this, this happened. Then that this happened. That happened as well. With like no, like no stressing in his voice at all. It is the most monotone delivery of a three-page monologue. Yeah, no, it's not. It's like <laughs> I just really quick. I got to get all these words out so we can get on to the next scene. Here. <laughs> uh, I right off the bat, I'm like, this is going to be a hard movie to write notes for. <laughs> it's going to be real difficult. <laughs> All right, so it took me a while to, for it to kick in, but I was like, so they just want to steal his music and kill him? It, it took me a minute to, to be like, would people do that? Are they really going to be that mean? <laughs> I, I didn't think they would. I... Oh, and then he's calling in the chicks for the audition, and he's like, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> That's how I, said. I don't know why I wrote that down as a note. It just made me laugh when he was doing it. Already right out the bat, like, oh man, poor Winslow. What a bummer. This poor guy. When he's got his face all smashed up and the two black cops are like taking him away. I was like, this poor fucking guy. 
But it's just that easy to escape from Sing I was going to say, I realize we forgot to talk about the fucking escape scene that could have been out of goddamn Forbidden Zone. Like, it's so ridiculous. You literally hop in a box. <laughs> that box goes in a truck. That tr- You fall off that truck 10 feet away from the fucking prison, and then you're gone. You're gone. Uh, it's so I, ridiculous, and it's all within like ten seconds. Oh, it's <laughs> so quick! And then he goes ripping through his office, and then runs out. Like, it's awesome. And uh, and then his head gets stuck in the record press, and he's like running away with his face all fucked up. And that was the point where I sent you a message on Facebook, Matt, and I was like, oh, "Holy shit! I just <laughs> what this movie is about to be!" And I'm so fucking pumped for it. <laughs> And I love that origin. So I love the origin story that his face was smashed by a record press. Yeah. Oh, so fucking good. <laughs> um, when the uh, explosion goes off in the back of the car, I'm like, that's how every Beach Boys concert should end. <laughs> <laughs> wow, fuck you, Swan, you dwarfish little asshat. I hate you. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So this is the song that I felt goes on. I was like, I know it's a full-blown musical but I could probably do with a few less of these extended musical numbers. Now, this is before the rest of the extended musical numbers came in. This is really the only one that I disliked, because immediately after that, I was like, except these crazy robot musical numbers, I'll do this shit all day. This is amazing. <laughs> and then he like gives him that voice, and I'm like, yes, yes, robot voice for all of this movie. Robot voices and metal teeth for everyone. So... I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys uh, caught this at all. I'm a big Paul Williams fan. The singing voice for The Phantom is Paul Williams' actual singing voice, the guy who plays Swan. Nice. Which is why there's that line of dialogue. The second that it sounds exactly like Paul Williams, it cuts to Paul Williams and goes, perfect. <laughs> like, and that's why uh, Swan doesn't have any songs in the movie because it he would just sound exactly like the Phantom from that point on. <laughs> The last, the last, like the credit song is, I mean, it's obviously not Swan, but that's very obviously Paul Williams that's singing that, that last credit song. Yes. Like, uh, as soon as I heard that, I was like, there's no other human being that that voice could be coming from (laughs) right now than that tiny little dude. That's definitely him. Tiny little dude from fucking the Smokey and the Bandit movies. Well, we're going to call him Dwarfish Asshat for the rest of the (laughs) This is this is Ramon all over again. This dwarfish ass. <laughs> uh, so I guess this movie's thesis is is fuck record execs. Like that's I mean it hammers it home real fuck. Record executives are literally the devil in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's awesome, but it's just like I mean I don't know. I'm not in the music industry. Is it? It feels like really heavy handed. I don't know. Like when when he steals that. Um, sheet music away from him and there's just like a million pills on top of it i don't know it's just it's a little i mean this movie's all about excess and i'm totally okay with this but i was like that's a little bit much i don't know about this but uh okay i want to be beef beef is my spirit animal (laughs) now this was before i heard him talk (laughs) and i realized (laughs) And I realized how flamboyantly gay he was. But this was like when he sang that song in like whatever the spotlight in that weird record room. And then he like opened the coffin. He was just like, (laughs) that was fucking awesome. (laughs) I was like, I want to be this guy. And then all of a sudden he started talking like this. (laughs) And I was like, so long as I get to be that other guy most of the time, (laughs) I'm all right with this. That's the point where I wrote, nah, that's bring me down um <laughs> this is the best live show ever if this was in my town i'd go see this every fucking night of the week this is, i'd be broken homeless and people would be like what are you an alcoholic living on the street i'd be like no i just have to go see fucking phantom of the paradise I, keep going, I gotta go see the i gotta go to paradise so i can see beef in the undeads yeah absolutely man <laughs> like, this show's so fucking good and I literally wrote the note. I was like, man, I hope Winslow holds off for a while because I really want to see the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> but then he immediately kills Beef with the... With the what a way to go, though. Genius. Yeah. Oh, totally fucking worth it. That guy died. I mean, he died a hero. Everybody was still chanting his name when he was getting carried out and stuff. Everybody loved him. Um, 
So okay, so wait, is this what is this what Winslow wanted Phoenix to perform? Was this opening number that Beef was doing? Could you imagine Phoenix? <laughs> like what? I don't understand well, why. From what I understand, it's not based on the music whatsoever that he's originally written at that point. Because <laughs> if you listen to what he's writing, it doesn't sound anything like what the song that actually comes out of that. Well, that yeah, and I guess there's that scene where they're like, "Make it your own" or whatever. Yeah. But, but I, uh, I mean, he still he was he was saying the whole time he was like, "I only want Phoenix." It's only going to be Phoenix. Yeah. I guess he just wanted Phoenix to get on stage and sing into a microphone for <laughs> 90 minutes. I don't know what he was fucking. Yeah, this guy's got some delusions, delusional thought. But, yeah, it was weird. I, I mean, it could only make sense that Beef would be the opening number and then it would cut to Phoenix. I, I guess they probably didn't think about it as hard as I'm thinking about it right now. Anyways, um... Okay, so then we cut to the scene where Phoenix fucks Swan, and my note is, yo, what the fucking fuck, Phoenix, you gigantic bitch. I'm so fucking angry right now. <laughs> I didn't I didn't write a note for another ten minutes because I was seriously, I was pissed off. I just, <laughs> I was really upset. In in Phoenix's defense, she met, when she's known Winslow for all of two minutes of her entire life. Yeah, like 120 <laughs> and I And I mean, whatever, and it's, and she says, you know, like, why that? Why should I believe you over them? I mean, you're just some creepy guy that's like getting all up in my grill over here. I don't fucking know, but I mean, I know Winslow. I know the character. I've been watching his struggles, so I'm angry. Uh, yeah, so I'm getting a little confused. I'm like, uh, so fucking what? There's like some supernatural shit going on here, and then we get the bathtub scene, which is a really good scene. I like that scene a lot. <laughs> Where it's just uh, Swan talking to himself in the mirror in that bathroom. Again, a little weird that, you know, it's like the film is going to age and you're not. <laughs> I don't, whatever. I don't need a real deep explanation. <laughs> it's, it's just Dorian Gray. It's like an updated, warped sort of version of Dorian Gray. And I'm yeah. okay. That's, that's okay. Um, and yeah, that last shot where Winslow is like dragging towards her on the floor and, and, you know, like begging her like to, to come to him and like offer him some comfort in his final moments is actually, it's a beautiful, uh, that's a beautiful way to end the movie. And she, I mean, I know Scott, you feel like it ended shitty, but you can see she's like crushed. She's like, wow. Right. No, no, no. I guess I just mean that it ended shitty in that, uh. Poor dude fucking died. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, where where was he going to go from there? <laughs> I guess you're right. That was the only way. I, I hadn't mean, thought this through. He, he died a martyr for his vision and his music. Uh, he obviously didn't get exactly what he wanted, but I, I guess the people in this universe, I mean, if this happened in your universe, you'd be talking about this to the end of time. Everyone would own this record. It'd be history, man. It'd be serious fucking history. So, uh, final thesis is it's hair mixed with Tommy, uh, definitely with a lot of Rocky Horror Picture Show, and a little bit of, like, some Alejandro Jodorowsky mixed in there, and it is fucking wonderful. I <laughs> loved it so much. Uh, that, oh. f- that makes me feel good that I got two in a row. <laughs> yeah, you're slam dunking it. Don't fuck up next round. Uh, I'm Just... going to. Trust me. Um, did you catch the, the the only other fun fact I have is that Rod Serling is the person who does the introduction narration. <laughs> no, I didn't know. Yeah. Rod Sterling? Uh, Serling. Yeah. Serling. Serling from Who's Twilight Zone. Oh, nice. Oh, the narr- Yeah, that is nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's for... 13 seconds in the beginning of the movie. Yeah, probably cost more than pretty much any actor got paid in the rest of the movie. Because <laughs> I'm pretty well, sure Jessica Harper the was looking at one. I don't know. It's... <laughs> Did, uh, if, you, if you look at the IMDb trivia, like it was weird. It was like Beef was supposed to be um, Winslow, and Winslow was supposed to be Swan, and Swan was supposed to be Beef, and like they, everybody was like supposed to be different roles. And like at the last moment, like Brian De Palma was like, 
okay, we're going to do some like quick changes. And thank God he fucking did. Can you imagine Swan as and as either Winslow or Beef in this movie? It'd be so fucking weird, man. Absolutely not as Beef. I could maybe see him pulling off Winslow. Maybe. Well, I guess his uh, his he said like, listen, I'm not physically able to pull off either of these other roles. Yeah. This is the role that requires like the least amount of physical exertion from me. So that's what I'll be able to do. Yeah. Life and Network. 